Here's the temperature and pressure chart we were using. I like to give these single charts out to my students so they can write on this chart as they're going through and write down these numbers, make marks on it. It's a simple way to start out understanding temperature, pressure, and saturation. But in the EPA test, you're gonna have a multi-chart. So you're gonna have a chart that's gonna look something like this. It's gonna have multiple different refrigerants along it and all of those convert to a temperature. This particular one is donated by ESCO Institute and it's in the back of their EPA 608 study guide. I do recommend getting that study guide if you're gonna take the EPA test, but we'll talk more about that later on. What I want you to do next is I want you to write down a list that I've made of these pressures. So these are just pressures, and these are for HCFC 410A. So we have 120 PSI, 144 PSI, 120 PSI, 176 PSI, 318 PSI, 368 PSI, 390 PSI, and 444 PSI. So if you write these down, I want you to pause the video and then find these on your temperature pressure chart. It didn't have to be this exact chart. Most of them are gonna be pretty close to the same. Now we're actually using a paper chart so you get practice using this before you get to your EPA test. Okay, we're gonna work these together. So we'll start off with HCFC for today. So we're gonna look on our chart. Here's 22, 404A, 407, 422D, 422B, R441A, and here we go. This is what we're looking for in HFC, R401A. It tells us it's an A1 refrigerant, um, global warming potential of 2,090 times greater than CO2. We'll get to those later, but we're going to circle this so we know that this is the line that we're looking for. Now that we have this, we're going to find our pressure. So our first pressure that I gave you was 120 PSI gauge. So we're going to scroll down through our list and find what's closest to 120. Now if we can see 120 is not on our list. We show 118 and we have 130. So we're going to be pretty much right between these two numbers. So I'm going to line up on the very bottom number at 130. And we're going to scroll over to the side and see what temperature it is. And it's going to be right between 40 and 45. So that number is going to translate to... So if you look over to the side it's closer to 118 than it is 130. So we're gonna be a little bit higher than 40 degree saturated temperature. So 120 would convert to say 41 degree saturated temperature. It doesn't have to be exact. It's gonna be fairly close. Now let's take the next number. We have 144. So we're gonna drop down and find 144. So we have 143, so that's pretty close. 143 converts over to a saturated temperature of 50. So I'm gonna make a little note here. We're gonna write down 50, I'll do 41, 50. And then we're going to down to the next one is 102. So 102 is actually gonna be way up here. So we see we don't have 102, we have 97 or 701. So if we look across there, we're gonna be right between those two, and we see it's between 30 and 35. So that number is gonna be actually pretty close to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So 32 degrees Fahrenheit, that's actually our freezing point. So we're just gonna make a little note here of 32, right between those two numbers. These are all actual numbers that you're gonna see on a operating system. The one that would worry me the most is the one that was at 32 because at 32 degrees, that evaporator coil is gonna start freezing up. So that's the temperature I'm gonna look at. Say so that's a very low temperature for my evaporator. I do not want it to freeze. We'll talk about everything that caused them to freeze later, but these are things we're looking for. I'm not looking for a low pressure. I'm looking for a low temperature. That's my red flag. Now let's look at the next number here. We have 276, this is gonna be our high side. So we're going to move over to 276, and on our list, we don't have 276. We have 275, which is really close, close enough for me. That shows us at a 90 degree saturated temperature. So I'm going to write 90. The next number we have is 318 PSI gauge. 318. That's at a 100 degree saturated temperature. So 
the refrigerant and the condenser would be 100 degrees. Let's say the air temperature was 80 degrees. The saturated temperature being 100 degrees. The air temperature is say 85. The refrigerant is warmer than the air. Heat would leave the refrigerant, go to the cooler air. So let's run through another set of numbers. Here's HCFC R22 PSI gauge. So in this particular temperature pressure chart, R22 is right here. So there's gonna be our pressures. We're gonna convert them to a saturated temperature. So here's a list of pressures. Go ahead and write these down. Pause the video, write these down, and we're gonna go through them together. All right, here we go. So we're gonna start off with 69. So I'm gonna find over here R22 at 69. We're kind of right between these two numbers here. We've got 68. 0.6 that's pretty close so this is going to be our pressure and notice that converts to a saturated temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit notice the before we already used 40 for 410a we had a different pressure but it also equaled 40 so this even though we're using different refrigerants we can still obtain the same saturated temperature so our next number we have is 84 so we have 84 right here 84 converts to a saturated temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit so we have also 57, we're gonna go back up to 57. And 57 is between these two numbers here, so 57 is gonna be right about here. That's at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So at 57, we're at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So that would be our low temperature we'd be worried about. 32 degrees says, hey, we're about to freeze up. So if I'm seeing 57 PSI, convert that to a saturated temperature of 32, danger, danger, Will Robinson, we're close to freezing. Next on the list, we have 168. So this is gonna be the high side, the red gauge. 168 converts to a saturated temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 90 would be warmer than the air temperature outside. So we have another temperature of 196. 196 converts to a saturated temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we have 226. So 200 and 26 right here that converts to a saturated temperature of 110 and we have 243 converts to a saturated temperature of 115 and then we have our saturated temperature of 278 sorry our pressure next over pressure of 278 converts to a saturated temperature of 125 degrees Fahrenheit so here's your answer list for those and notice we had a complete different refrigerant with the complete different pressures, but we still obtain the exact same saturated temperature. So if you're using different refrigerants as we go through this course, you're going to see that that saturated temperature, that boiling point for the evaporator, the condensing point for the condenser, that's what we look at. My boiling point, my evaporator point, the suction saturated needs to be below the air temperature to absorb heat. And outside, my condensing temperature, my condensing saturated, my liquid saturated, needs to be higher than the air temperature to reject heat. So we convert our pressure to a saturated temperature. This is called a temperature pressure chart, saturated chart. Now, I've tricked you guys because I've covered this up because I wanted you focusing only on the very outside numbers, which are pressure. But in reality, they have a temperature pressure chart already built into them. So here's an example of our temperature and pressure chart. The very outside numbers right here is our pressure, and inside we have multiple different numbers. These are our saturated temperature. Same thing as this chart right here. Let's take a look at some examples. Let's say that my needle was pointing at, uh, we'll do 40 PSI gauge. We look at the next line on here and it's red, and it's pointing at about 42 degrees Fahrenheit, and that red line's R12. The next line down, the next line down is R22. That's green, so if you follow the green line, as it's pointing at 40 degrees here, we're actually at about 10, 20, 25, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we're at about 16 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we're using, in this case, this pink line, which is 502, at 40 PSI gauge, it would also be a saturated temperature of about eight degrees Fahrenheit. So if we were to move this on up, let's say at about 69, our needle's bent here, it's an old set. Let's say we were to move our 
let's say we just move our pressure up to say 69 degrees Fahrenheit, right below 70. The green line is R22, so the saturated temperature for R22 would be at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll move the needle, you see the 40. So if we're pointing at this temperature, it automatically gives you the pressure. So what we used to do in the older days was we, would, we wouldn't even really look at this outside number. We'd only be looking at the number of the refrigerant. This is a saturated temperature. It converts the pressure to a saturated temperature for you. And it was quite handy. Now the problem is, as we get new refrigerants, we had new gauges that had more numbers on them. But there's only a very limited amount of numbers that you can fit in this spot. So the temperature pressure chart is going to be very important in that case. Now the other thing I want to point out, notice how wide this needle is. There's two problems with that. One problem is, as I'm pointing to this number, it's hard to see, am I below 50, above 50, what number exactly am I at? It gets quite difficult. Now if you look at these numbers, here we have 20, here we have 30, so increments of 2, so 20 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So if I'm pointing over here at 50, what number am I at on my saturated chart? So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, approximately 6. What if my needle is a little bit more this way? or a little bit more this way. It gets quite difficult to read that number. So they were horribly inaccurate because you can't see the number very easily. That's where that temperature pressure chart came in. It made it easier for you to read. But this is antiquated. Let's show you a little better way of doing this. Another option we have is digital gauges. Digital gauges give us a PSI rating and in this case a vapor saturated temperature. So at zero PSIG, our saturated temperature, boiling temperature would be at 62.6. .6. And also the head pressure, zero PSI, our saturated temperature would be at 62.6. .6. What we're going to do is we're going to put a little bit of pressure on here and see how that changes. So add a little bit of pressure, and our suction pressure is now 119.9, so it's basically 120 PSI gauge. That means my saturated temperature would be at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. My refrigerant would be boiling at 40 degrees on the inside coil. This is a fast way of doing it because I can just look at this number and immediately I get to see what my saturated temperature is. I can see my suction saturated temperature inside and my liquid saturated temperature outside. We have another brand that is very similar. Here we have some other options. These are probes. These are really nice because what I can do with these is I can put them directly onto a unit without having to have any hoses. There's less loss that we have to deal with. And they have lights on them. This one also hooks Bluetooth. It hooked to a Bluetooth to your phone. And with that, you can actually convert it to a saturated temperature on your temperature pressure chart from there. Many, many more different types. We're going to go through these and talk about the benefits and the downside of each one. But what is nice is with the digital equipment, it is much, much more accurate, gives you a much more precise number, and as convenience goes, it gives you a temperature pressure chart built into the unit right there for you. So that's really, really nice. Accuracy is my main concern. Having that saturated temperature is also a benefit, and these things do much, much more on top of that. So eventually it's going to be your goal, but you still have to get past the EPA test and also understand a basic temperature pressure chart before you can really appreciate what these digital sets do.